this idea of existential panic, I think, is uh, probably central to what I am, or what we are, or however you want to phrase that, how, whatever consciousness is. Um, and I remember that one of the first uh, sort of coherent brushes with existential panic resulted from me questioning um, the unity or duality of me versus the universe. Uh, for example, let's say that uh, we listen to what the empiricists have to say and that we know things primarily through our senses. All right, well, that's, I think most of us live our lives that way. Um, <laughs> can we know ourselves through our senses? Well, yes, we're just products of biology. We're yada, yada, yada. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is consciousness itself experiences themselves, uh, qualia themselves. Can we know those things empirically? I don't think we can. That stuff you have to be on the receiving end. Um, the receiving end of all the stuff that the senses send through. Uh, what is it that sees that which is seen? Um, light comes from the outside, it gets filtered through my eyes into my brain, and it reaches eventually my consciousness that evaluates it. Um, now that is sort of a third person singular observer watching what happens to somebody else. What about being part of that equation? <laughs> uh, the, the perspective that you're going to develop on that is going to be radically different. It's all very well for me to sort of say that this is what's happening when this happens, but what if you're the one that's it's happening too. You're on the receiving end of that experience. You're the one that's on the receiving end of that qualia. You can't um, approach that in the same way. You can't approach your qualia empirically. You can't uh, approach um, your consciousness empirically. You can approach the idea of consciousness empirically. Now, <clears throat> this does not debunk empiricism not by a long shot. It just means that we've got to understand that empiricism is a tool, uh, and tools, by their very nature, have limitations. This doesn't mean that I'm going to start assuming that whenever I strike a match, nothing's going to happen, or water is going to start pouring out, or something like that. But I think that people who have sort of built a, an edifice, a sort of a psychological life raft out of say, their ism of choice, say, in this case we're talking about empiricism, and suddenly you realize that that tool has its limitations, it can, that's more than just kicking a prop away, that's having the rug violently yanked out from underneath you. Um, or it can be, I guess. Um, I, uh, I, I think that that was quite a shocker when I came across that, because this may sound strange, but uh, the way that I normally approach at least the workaday world is highly empirically. Uh, you know, I eat a sandwich and it fulfills a need, or um, I uh, avoid traffic when I'm on my bicycle because I don't feel like having my body all smashed up and everything. That's all based on empiricism. Um, but on a different level, on the level of existence, I'm not really sure if that can solve some of the problems that come up when I start to examine things. Um, can it tell me what I am? I don't mean where I came from, what the circumstances that resulted in my existence are, um, or how the systems that constitute my body can be explained, or whatever. Um, can science and empiricism tell me what qualia are, what experiences are, um, what time is? I. Maybe they can, but I haven't come across anything that, in, in, at least in, in terms of uh, empiricism, that can uh, deal with that sort of thing. Now, the road has just gone off one of the maps that you've been relying on. Now, what do you do? Well, it, at, at first, you're terribly disoriented. But in a sense, that's kind of your own fault for putting too much, um, too much store in man-made maps, in maps that are essentially just maps. They're not the thing that you, that you, um, they're not the thing that you're actually trying to see. It's just a diagram of the thing. It's not the thing itself. <clears throat> now, how many times over the course of our life do we get 
I won't say tricked, but we, we sort of lull ourselves into thinking that the diagram is what we're actually seeing. Uh, and it's when that illusion, or perhaps that, um, what would we call it, that um, over-reliance on something, uh, that sort of unjustified confidence gets shaken that we start to feel some panic. Um, or at least that I would start to feel panic. Uh, there's kind of no we in existential thinking, but anyway, that's another story. Um, that's when I would get shaken up by things, when a lot of rules that I thought were pretty much axiomatic and more than axiomatic engraved in stone uh, suddenly were revealed to be not so engraved in stone and that it was just a creation, or perhaps not a creation, but a map. Uh, a map resembles the underlying reality, but it's not the underlying reality. Uh, so, say, scientific theory, psychological theory, history, whatever you want to, whatever subject, whatever ism, or whatever concept you want to come up with, um, is a tool. It's not the thing in and of itself <clears throat> that you're actually trying to uh, measure, that you're trying to understand. Now, the tools get threatened. Uh, the tools are shown to be just tools and not some sort of absolute reality, and you get scared. Um, and or I get scared, or I got scared, or whatever you want to say. That's, that's where I think that a lot of existential panic, existential fear comes from. Things that you rely on are threatened. Now, maybe it's sort of as um, knowledge is free, as mentioned in uh, the comment section of some a previous video that I made. It's your own fault. You've built sort of a house of cards, which you assumed was made out of bricks, and uh, when those bricks start to, or sorry, when those cards start to sort of fall down, uh, you know, you're terribly disoriented by this. Uh, but actually, making a house out of cards, but you know that you've made it out of cards, and when it starts to fall down, you go, huh, I knew this was inevitable. That's not the same thing as building a house of cards and assuming that it's solid. So we can sort of integrate an empirical point of view into an essentially skeptical or existential point of view um, by saying that, okay, I can't ignore reality that's going on around me. I have to somehow cope with it all. Um, I know what happens when I try to ignore it. When I try and say, uh, you know, uh, the house of, uh, house of cards is just a house of cards, but it's the only house that there is, and... Uh, or, or there is no house at all. I don't even need to cope with any of this. Well, watch what happens when you try to do that. Um, the, the outside world will sort of come at you in ways that are difficult to ignore. Uh, since we're talking about uh, existentialism, the existentialist realized reality is smacking you square in the face in the form of the uh, Third Reich. You can sort of ignore things and get all intellectual and airy-fairy about everything, but the existential reality, or, or sorry, <laughs> external reality, has a, a way of reasserting itself, whether you want it to or not, or whether you sort of, you know, quietistically say it doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> so you can, you, it's this apparent contradiction between the absolute ne necessity of coping with the outside world and the absolute pointlessness of trying to cope with the outside world that can cause some um, pretty crazy uh, existential terror. Um, pretty unbearable, really. Okay, I, this, this outside world which creates things like the Holocaust, I've got to somehow deal with it, but it doesn't alter the fact that the outside world is at the end of the day kind of meaningless because reality is all taking place up here. We have apparently a fundamental paradox here or a fundamental catch-22, a truly horrible situation. If I ignore the outside world, then Hitler takes over. But if I believe too much in the outside world, I'm believing, I'm, I'm believing in something that is a house of cards. So now what do I do? Well, yeah, okay, see where the where the real terrors come in. Um, you can't, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. How do you approach that? Well, there's any number of ways in which uh, one can approach that. Some uh, li lines of thinking have said, you do 
what you can, and only you know if you're doing that. I'm sure that a lot of people who were involved in some pretty terrible situations, wars, etc., and had to make some very difficult moral choices, um, were able, at least, to walk away thinking, okay, in all, in all honesty, and they weren't lying to themselves, I did my best in, you know, with all the crazy moral choices that I was forced to make by the circumstances. Um, and, you know, again, that's, we're down to the sort of, um, there are things in the world that you can control and things in the world that you can't control, and the trick is to know which are which. When you're in a situation where you have to make a terrible moral choice, you can sort of say, okay, is this of my making, or am I, have I been thrust into this circumstance? And if I've been thrust into this circumstance, then all that I can really be reasonably expected to do is what I can do, what it's within my power to do. So there's a way to deal with, morally speaking, you know, the, the Third Reich. What are you going to do? Okay, what can I do? What honestly can I do? Um, and then you do what you can. You have, actu you have actually acted as a moral agent in the world. You have actually sort of done what you can, because if you don't do what you can to when, when something dreadful happens, uh, then that's going to create even more attention within you, and that's going to sort of make the world, it's really going to ramp up the, the world's ability to mess you up, to mess everybody up. Um, if you just disregard it, if you just sort of say the world doesn't make sense. Well, somebody will come along to show you quite conclusively that maybe the world doesn't make sense, but it can get pretty horrible. Uh, really horrible, as in horror beyond your wildest dreams, as in Auschwitz or whatever. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a huge tension there. We've got to do something about that, but the outside world is crazy. So again, you do what you can, and then you move on. I don't really see, a, you know, that, that that's really morally problematic. Um, some people will simply say, and again, I come from the Catholic background, they'll say you can, the, the assumption is you've never done enough. You're always responsible for that concentration camp. You've never, you will, th that, that is a level of guilt that's on you personally uh, that will never be expunged. They, they don't come out and say this, of course, but that's the implication. If you If you don't feel guilty about it, for all eternity, then you are basically one of the guards or executioners in that camp. Okay, well that, again, that's when you turn ethics and morals back upon themselves, when morality itself, ethics itself, becomes toxic because it's pointless, it's not going anywhere. Um, so you have to sort of find some way to cope with the horrors of the outside world. And that's what, again, that's what the 20th century existentialists had to do. They had to cope with the fact that they might have said, okay, based on our experiences earlier, like the First World War, the best thing to do is to say, well, to hell with the world. The world is a crazy place, and this war politics business is insane, and I just don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, when you do that, then you're kind of <laughs> abdicating moral responsibility for everything in the world. And that has problems all of its own. Um, but again, if you get too caught up in the outside world, in the in the um, the uh, uh, the empirical world, the world that you can see outside of yourself, you neglect this, which has terrible problems all of its own. Because you say, if that's all that this this life thing is, is simply you know, putting out fires everywhere. Every time that a, a Hitler in one form or another comes along, I've got to rush over there with my hose and spray it down with water. And as soon as I do that, of course, another fire is going to break out over there, so i got to rush over there and do that. And, you know, that's it, it just seems that, that this is the lesson that, that you know, the, the worst that humanity can do has taught us, that there's always going to be some horror out there that we've got to deal with. Yes, <clears throat> there probably will be. But again, you're sort of mistaking dealing with the outside world and dealing with what's in here. Empirically, we've got to deal with what's going on around us. Um, there's huge moral issues. There's huge <laughs> physiological issues, huge physical issues with not dealing with it. There are extreme cases where people sort of say, okay, I'm not dealing with this anymore. I've had enough. So you, uh, you know, or the equivalent. You just sort of say, all right, the, the world doesn't make any sense to me anymore, and I'm pulling away from it decisively. 
Uh, okay, that's that's an option too. But other people could even say that, like the, the, the again, <laughs> the Catholic view is that too is an abdication of moral responsibility, and that's not enough. Okay, well, then you've got to start dealing. You have to start fighting your battles in here, um, where empiricism really is of very little assistance. Now, an interesting uh, thought is that, and, and again, this caused some sort of existential tension in my life. How big is the world in here compared to the world out there? <laughs> Quite a thought, isn't it? Um, okay, well, just explore the inside of your head. Explore your own mind. It's gigantic in there. Um, the number of experiences that you've got cataloged in your own mind. It, it boggles the brain when you think about that. Um, value judgments, all the stuff that's stored up in there, all the evaluations that you're putting on things. Can you make sense of that empirically? Not in terms of explaining it, because when you're explaining it, you're explaining it to somebody else. I'm talking about explaining or calcu uh, cataloging or evaluating what's going on inside your own head experientially. That is something that you've got to do alone. And if you neglect that, if you ask me, um, I think that that too can create tension that can lead to fear. Um, the outside world exists. Yes, so do I. I exist. And I have to acknowledge that or else the I-ness or the the, the consciousness itself, the thing that's on the receiving end of experiences and qualia, uh, is going to assert itself in ways that aren't necessarily convenient for the outer world, the empirical world. Um, you've got to pay attention to what's going on on the inside. Now, what's inside, what you dig up when you start looking around in there, is often not pleasant. Uh, it's often terrifying. But it's in there. And you can either run from it, or you can face it. Now, again, I spoke yesterday about this, and I said that, that it's absolutely essential that we show some sort of self-discipline. Uh, because you can't just, like... You can't just sort of charge right into the recesses of your mind, the, the, the you know more obscure places. I suppose you could. You might find something really nice. Uh, lucky you if you do, which you know I've done before. Uh, but you can also find some pretty horrible things, or I shouldn't say horrible things, but you can find some pits of fear, pits of terror in there. Um, now again, uh, you take it incrementally and show self-discipline, and you know don't just sort of charge in. And I think that you can come to terms with a lot of what's in there. I haven't, I'm, I'm 48 and I've been doing this for as long as I, I can remember, but you can sort of approach uh, the real uncertainties inside your own mind and the real terrors inside your own mind and your own neuroses or whatever uh, deliberately and patiently, or if you do approach them that way and, you know, over a long period of time, I think that you can come to terms with a lot of the, the fear that you feel. You can get used to the fact that on a certain level, life doesn't make sense, that um, life doesn't sort of work. Uh, you can you can come to terms with the fact that there is a, a seeming... We're, se we're seemingly damned to sort of live in two universes at once, in this universe and the one out there. Um, but again, it's... I think that because it's such a difficult thing to talk about and words start to fail, as Ramshack has said yesterday, you almost have to develop an entirely different vocabulary. Uh, and by the way, attempts have been made to develop a vocabulary that deals with the inner life, uh, the inner life rather, the life inside your own consciousness, the life of experience, the life of qualia. But the problem is, of course, uh, you can't really talk about it effectively using normal language based on empirical experience, em empirical evidence rather, of one's senses. Um, you have to talk about it metaphorically, elliptically, uh, parabolically. You have to use parables. Uh, and that inevitably starts to sound like 
religion. <laughs> and people just don't want, well, I won't say people don't want to hear that, but um, people who are rejecting what they view as fairy tales don't really want to use that kind of language just because of how it sounds. Well, um, I guess that, yeah, if, if that's your sort of way of... Um, if, if you simply can't come at things parabolically, if you can't use the, the, the language of parables to describe things, then we'll have, you, you'll have to do, I guess, what, what a lot of um, existentialists did. They, they used uh, fiction, actually, to make a lot, of their, a lot of their points, and they dealt with people's inner life and people's experiences and tried to put you in the author's head uh, when you're um, in certain circumstances and how you react and how you feel. Um, but discussing what's going on inside the mind and discussing it from an experiential point of view it can be an extremely frustrating um, and perhaps futile experience. Um, but merely pointing that out actually helps, in my mind, calm the existential uh, or a certain source of existential panic, existential anxiety, uh, angst. You realize that, okay, uh, I'm trying to do something that's impossible here. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to describe to someone else what my experiences are. I'm trying to explain to somebody what my experience of the color blue is, and it's just not going to happen. Ah, uh, that actually, when you're when you realize what is beyond your power, now that's one of those things that I think that that is truly beyond our power is to conclusively explain our experiences to someone else, our qualia. Um, I don't think that we can do that. Now, remember I said earlier, there's things in the world you can control, things that you can't control, things that you can deal with, things that you can't deal with, things that um, are within your power to influence and things that are not within your power for, to influence. Well, it's, it's good to know that one of your limits is your ability to communicate your experiences. That, if you ask me, is a very valuable lesson, that there are certain things that you simply can't, in the very nature of things, do. One of the reasons I think that I have had, um, and this was 20 years ago, I guess, existential panics was the sudden realization that I can't get certain points across to people that I care about intimately, um, that I can't express certain important, central, utterly important things. I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Oh, Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood, said the animals. Um, you're going to be misunderstood. <laughs> you're going to be taken out of context. People are going to get mad at you when you're attempting to actually uh, de-escalate an angry situation. You're going to make certain situations worse when you're trying to fix them because fundamentally our ability to communicate with each other has limitations. Now that uh, that's a terrible lesson for people to learn, but it has to be learned. Um, it can cause panic at the beginning, but then you sort of go, okay, ah, I get this. This is not something that I that, that, that comes so easily. This is a hard lesson that I had to learn. But, you know, again, sometimes the only way you can really conclusively learn something is the hard way. I had to learn that this is beyond my capacity. And the fear taught me this. Well, now, I, in, in a sense, now that the fear is has served its purpose... I sort of look at a big problem and I can now say, I can't do anything about that. Or, my, or I, perhaps not, I can't do anything about it. But conclusively, my ability to influence this big problem is limited. <laughs> it's amazing how important that is to know what your limitations are in terms of dealing with anything. Um, but you, it's, it's also amazing how... Uh, how what would I um, how nice I guess or no it's not true it's not really nice how um, unfearful it is how fear soothing it is to suddenly see the boundaries of what is possible because fear is the uncertainty even uncertainty even knowledge that you can never do something is still a certainty and 
fear actually breaks down or shows, demonstrates um, unclearness, but fear actually points the way, ironically, to a new clarity. Um, knowing what is not possible is a form of clarity. Um, fear is very unpleasant. In fact, it's terrible, but it has its uses. Another ramble. I'm just going to upload it without proofreading it, as it were.